Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Arkham Sessions. My name is Brian Ward. With me, as always, the psychologist to the superheroes, superheroines, and supervillains of Gotham City, Dr. Andrea Letamendi. Hi, Brian. How are you? Doing really well. How are you? I'm well. I think congratulations are in order. That is true. Why don't you tell everyone why congratulations are in order? Well, we are the recipients of an award from the Geek Speak Show. Mm -hmm. Our friend, uh, fellow podcaster Henry, over at the Geek Speak Show had announced recently that we have won Best Podcast slash Blog on their their end of year um, annual Show. award yeah, show award so show. congratulations yeah congratulations to you and that, that's a great honor especially seeing who we were up against there were a number of good other uh, you know our competitors were were pretty fantastic including john our friend john champion from mission log right of mission log one of our personal favorites there you know every every episode of star trek is. Yeah, they go through every episode of Star Trek and talk about its relevance today. And it, like like what we do, they analyze it from a certain perspective. So we were definitely in good company. Yeah. And we, of course, we know John from our what second iteration of our Star Trek versus Star Wars, uh, Psychology of Star Trek versus Star Wars panel. And, That's and right. Uh, that was uh, fantastic. You guys can see that panel on YouTube, of course. Uh, but uh, I highly recommend that you go and check out the end of year awards show episode of the Geek Speak show. We'll be sure to put that on the in the show notes. Uh, over at underthemaskonline.com uh, because there are a lot of really great categories and they spend a lot of time uh, focusing on a lot of really great stuff that you should absolutely check out. So thanks for that. And then there's another reason for us to be congratulating one another, I think. That's right. So the Daily Dot actually featured us um, in commemoration of our one-year anniversary. Yay. They put up an article kind of talking about our origin story, yeah. really, our, our history, how we came up with this idea, what we've been up to over the last year, and uh, it's and a fantastic... And where we would like to go after yeah. the year. Yeah. So, yeah, so so we answered some questions about um, not just how we do the show and why, but, but what do we plan on doing in the future? Yeah, it was a really great article. Uh, again, couldn't recommend uh, going and, and reading it enough. So. Yeah, so Lisa Granshaw is the author of that article, and the article can be found on the daily dot and once again we'll be sure to put that uh that link up on the show notes we will so uh, so go and enjoy that but enough of this self-congratulatory stuff we're going to move forward and we're going to go into this week's episode i am the knight uh no 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 oh. we are covering what is reality but but what is reality is it's an episode that takes place in a virtual reality world. Clearly, there's no psychology there, right? No, there's a ton of psychology in virtual reality. That that's a, okay. Well, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna I, I issue the challenge then, Drea. We're gonna I accept. We're going to uh, analyze the psychology of what is reality. Actually, I'm happy that we're talking about this show because uh, it's actually a really good episode and uh, I enjoyed it a lot. It was written by Marty Eisenberg and Robert Skur. It was directed by Dick Sebast. And once again, we get to play with the Riddler. And I like this episode because it actually shows that the Riddler has a little bit of consistency. We'll explain why in a moment. But as any good cartoon starts out, this one starts out with a, a slightly overweight guy doing some jogging at night and uh, steps off in an ATM machine. Uh, no, why do people hang out by themselves in the, in the late hours in Gotham City after everything we've been through. Yeah, if you live in Gotham City, I can't imagine why you would decide to go out at night at this point. Uh, because even though the Batman 
is in Gotham at night. So much stuff happens at nighttime there. What is wrong with this guy? I no idea. No idea. You know what I'm thinking? Tourist. Maybe. Maybe that's why he's stopping off at the ATM while on his nightly jog. He this needs is true. A couple hundred bucks for the cab, you know, in order to get back to the airport the but next again, day or something. But again, bad decision, because as soon as he hits that ATM, bad things happen. Well, coming to Gotham City was your first mistake. But uh, he, he goes to the ATM, and naturally, first thing that pops up, as any ATM does, a riddle. Where does a 500-pound gorilla sleep? Drea? No idea. All right. We're going to find out the answer to that and more later. But this guy finds out that he has no funds in his account, which is not cool. Um, this isn't the only place where this is happening. It's also happening at the stock market. What's worse than a millipede with flat feet? Drea? Again, no idea. Oh. And we also find out that at the DMV, uh, they are asked... How do you get five elephants into a compact car? Drea. Mm, mm. Yeah, no. All right. Well, a giant uh, box is delivered and it's ticking at the police headquarters. And Batman, Robin, and Commissioner Gordon are there to check it all out. What we've got here is a variation on the ancient Chinese puzzle box. And uh, inside, there is a gigantic computer console with a big digital timer. And uh, while this is going on, uh, bad guys disguised as cops are out stealing Edward Nigma's paper files. Uh, and they, when they bring him back to him, he shreds them. Batman figures out the answers to those riddles. Where does a 500-pound gorilla sleep? What's worse than a millipede with flat feet? And how do you get five elephants into a compact car? Anywhere at once, a giraffe with a sore throat, and uh, two in the front seat, two in the back, and one in the trunk. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Any schoolboy knows those. It turns out the answers to these riddles are really kind of irrelevant. It's the riddles themselves that hold the importance because the riddles themselves have numbers. 500, uh, the millipede is, is obviously a reference to a thousand, and five elephants. Now let's convert them to Roman numerals. Look. DMV. Department, Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles. Vehicles. Ooh, like the nastiest place on earth. They go to the DMV, and there they foil another robbery of all of Edward Nigma's driving files, uh, which is, it's interesting. Nigma seems to be trying to erase almost all record of his existence. Right. Right. It's like he wants to kind of eradicate this other identity that he has. Yeah. And we actually find out why a little bit later. And I like that they did this. It's also interesting because you can tell that this episode was was in the early 90s because uh, you would think that all of these records today would be online. But he is more concerned with the hard copies mm -hmm. of these files. Um but all of this also seems to be a little bit of a distraction because back at police headquarters, while Batman is 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 taking down the bad guys and, and you know, wrestling with robotic driving cars that are filled with nitroglycerin, uh, Robin and Commissioner Gordon are investigating this computer. It's a virtual reality program. Instead of using a keyboard or joystick, you put this puppy on and enter a whole computer-generated world and interact with everything in it as if it actually existed. We, we've all seen it in the 90s especially. It was a very popular place to hang out in science fiction. You, you had The Matrix. You had Lawnmower Man. You had other movies and, and books uh, and, and, and TV shows that dealt with virtual reality. And uh, today we look at this and we're like, well, we're kind of there. Like, this yeah, episode absolutely. was sort of ahead of its time. You absolutely. Know, we got like the Oculus Rift and, and things like that. Uh, if you'd gone to Comic-Con last year, you had an opportunity to, to go and hang out with the, uh, the, the really awesome Game of Thrones, um, you know, Oculus Rift. Uh, experience and and that was absolutely fantastic right so, so so for people who don't know what the oculus riff is do you want to describe that that experience it is like a virtual reality i mean you you know it's it's probably the highest end vr at this point uh you know it's got the the sort of for lack of a better term the goggles the headset 
uh, and you're given an opportunity to sort of experience this world in three dimensions. And, uh, and, and it's so much so, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it, it's so much so that you, you know you're in VR, but your body still reacts in such a way that you, you're disoriented. Right. You don't so exactly know how you feel about it. Your, your perception is that you are in this, in this made up world and, mm-hmm. and you kind of trick your body into, into believing that it's in that world. Yeah. Cause I, you know, at the game of Thrones, uh, when you, you go up, I, you know, if people are familiar with game of Thrones, you've got the wall mm-hmm. and, uh, this just giant icy fortress and you go up to the top of the wall and then arrows are shot at you. And at some point in time, you're shot with an arrow and you fall off the wall. Wow. And all of this feels like you're doing these things. And because you are given this 3D environment, you are the one who determines what it is you're looking at at any given time. You could look behind you, down the hall, you could you could do any of this and it's all right there uh, you know, at your disposal. So the Riddler's virtual reality is not too unlike that. It, yeah. It's you. It is somewhat um, minimal and simple in that that world is kind of two tone. Mm-hmm. You're you've got just red and black colors. Mm-hmm. You're um, you know there, there's not really a landscape. It's more about kind of objects in front of you. Yeah. And as of course we've got Commissioner Gordon hooked up to this via this uh, this headset that he's wearing. Unfortunately, Commissioner Gordon becomes zapped and trapped inside the virtual reality world. And this is bad news. Uh, of course, Edward Nigma has a clue for how Batman can can figure out sort of not only where he is, but where he can find Gordon. And that is by... Uh, after this robotic car with nitroglycerin explodes, Batman answers a payphone. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no tales. Another riddle, Enigma. It all makes sense when you add it up. And he is given four quarters and a penny. Well, he figures out that the penny is a red cent and, uh, and that it's made of copper. And another word for copper is policeman. And, uh, and then you've got the fact that the quarters are all uh, up on heads, so they are no tails, and that must equal head quarters. So you, you've got police head quarters, and if you add up four quarters and a penny, you come up with one dollar and one cent, so they must be at the police headquarters in room 101. This is really elaborate. Well, taking Batman straight to the exact room where he came from, where he left Commissioner Gordon. So that whole like that whole scene ends with Batman just going right back to where he came from, which might be absolutely brilliant now that I think about it. Now that I think about the fact that Nigma is probably just laughing his butt off as uh, he pulled Batman away from there. With the DMV riddle, mm-hmm. and then trapped Gordon while Batman was gone, and now he's just like, "Oh, you can come back now." You, I, yeah, I got he's something just, for you to say. Well, and and there was a lot of action in that scene. So mm-hmm. you know, the way that I look at it is, it's not a useless scene. Mm-hmm. It's the rest of the episode really just kind of takes place in virtual reality where they're just sitting down with helmets on. So maybe this was a way for, for us to have some real action. Yeah. And, and sure enough, it lures him right back to to the supercomputer at the police headquarters. So Robin is the one who sort of figured out this virtual reality world. He went through and he checked out all the files. He determined that the computer itself was not online. However, there was a hard connection which I guess was hooked up to a modem or something. And that's how the Riddler ended up getting in through this virtual reality world. And I like this episode because it gives Robin an opportunity to shine. Robin is clearly of a younger generation, someone who is a little more technologically advanced than Batman. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't argue that Batman clearly knows computers and gadgets and technology. However, Robin is the one who was addicted to the maze of the Minotaur game that the Riddler or Edward Nigma actually created. And he's the one that knew how to solve various puzzles. He's the one who knew about the flying hand and what it does and how you end up getting it and things like that. 
And in this case, Robin's the one that finds the virtual reality and discovers what it is and sort of how you can play with it. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, that's how Gordon gets trapped. And Batman has to go into this VR world and get Gordon out. The only way you're going to be able to do that when you're dealing with the Riddler is by uh, solving the Riddler's problems. And we talked about this with the last episode with the Riddler. Batman feels almost this compulsion to solve the riddle, the, the riddles, would you not? Would you not say? I mean, I guess in this case he has to because now he is literally in an environment where the Riddler um, basically manipulates everything. Right, I mean, like it's, he's, it's crea- his world. he's created this world. But the cool thing about this is that Batman has found a way to kind of um, to deviate or override or, or even defy these these riddles and these rules. Yeah. Because he has discovered, if this truly is virtual reality, I can manipulate this world. I can manipulate my environment. I can, you know, turn my my hands and arms into sledgehammers and just just pound my way through this this box puzzle rather than have to solve it. So there's, um, it's kind of cool that he's realized that he can kind of gain control in a world where initially he believed that he was powerless. Let's talk a little bit about the psychology of this realization and and this moment for Batman, because when he was dealing with the outside world and Nygma had recreated the maze of the Minotaur and he had put a hostage there at the center of it who was very much in peril. I mean, that person was going to die at the hands of the Minotaur, at the scimitar of the Minotaur. I'm totally lost now. Batman played the game. He did everything he needed to do. When you're talking about an environment where Batman could just fly over the maze in the uh, in the Batwing and parachute in, he he instead played the game. And mm-hmm. we talked uh, during that episode about the fact that we understand that it's a 22-minute show and that Batman needs to do these things. However, we also talked that it almost seemed like something Batman felt compelled to do. When he is in an environment that is not real, Batman doesn't feel that compulsion. In fact, Batman decides to manipulate the system and you know, gives himself sledgehammers for hands Mm -hmm. and and tries to find ways to cheat the riddles. Uh, He is presented with uh, an opportunity to play chess and uh, he is knighted, since he is the Dark Knight, he is knighted on the chess board. And Robin actually tells him that he has to move like a knight on the board, which I think is really cool. They, they, They really give Robin, you know, some good opportunities. Well, and I think, you know, this, this appeals to a lot of us. I'm a huge chess nerd. I'm a puzzle nerd. You know, I didn't know any of the riddles, of course, because frankly, a lot of people know this, but riddles are, are, are cultural things. They're things that we, we learn from our community and our parents. And, Mm -hmm. and you just know the answer to those a lot of times. Um, but the, the puzzles and, and chess and some of this sort of real, real cool stuff that's happening in this episode can appeal to a lot of us who, who, you know, for, for a lot of us, those are hobbies. Yeah. So for him to realize, oh, I'm the dark knight, I, I must move like a chess piece. Mm-hmm. That was, that was really cool to see. And, and in fact, he did move like that chess piece, like the knight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, later in the episode, they talk about astrology and certain constellations and, and their configurations and their relationship to each other. And that's how he was able to solve that particular problem. So um, the episode is really cool in that it brings in a lot of these other uh, educational, interesting themes. And you've got Robin and Batman working together to kind of, you know, to solve these problems. Yeah. Let's talk about that. We You mentioned the constellations. Once he wins... He becomes knighted. He he is placed on a Pegasus, which is a mythological horse with wings. Pegasus actually takes me back to that first episode of Maze of the Minotaur. Riddler and Nygma 
seems fixated on mythology, which I think is really cool. I like that the writers of this episode actually drew from that first episode and continued with the theme because then, uh, you know, the Pegasus ends up flying past Orion and, and through, you know, goes through the constellations, like you said, and they have to find the right one. And, and I thought that was really cool. The idea that Nygma likes to use mythology where he can in these riddles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a nice reference to that first. Well, right. And, and, I agree. But of course, being the nerd that I am, I I think it's, it's super awesome that uh, Batman and Robin have to utilize their knowledge around these areas to get through this. Yeah. And there's, so there's a lot of creative problem solving involved in this episode. It's not just, you know, Batman throwing punches and, and putting bad guys away. This is, you know, in order for me to get through this virtual reality test, I have to solve certain problems and I have to use some creative thinking and, and really up my cognitive game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, they're, they're wearing helmets. So this is all really happening in the brain. So it's, it's really cool that, that you see all of this problem solving happening. And, you know, I've talked about this before that for, for kids who feel stuck or who feel down or who feel um, like they have a lot of problems in their lives the first thing we teach them uh, in, in terms of uh, therapy is problem solving. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you identify a problem? How do you come up with different solutions? How do you try them out? How, how do you use creative thinking? And it's great that we actually see Batman model this process. He actually fails throughout, you know, he, he stumbles, he has to rethink, he has to have Robin assist him, Mm -hmm. but ultimately he's really engaging in a lot of this wonderful cognitive problem solving. And that gets him through that, that helps him to succeed. And, and that I think is like one of the best aspects of this episode. Yeah. And they get a really good opportunity to dive a little bit into how the Riddler thinks as well when Batman is placed in front of the Baxter's box, which is very reminiscent of like a Rubik's cube. And Batman then gives himself sledgehammers for hands and decides he's going to break the Baxter's box rather than solve it, which upsets Nygma. Nygma actually shows up and replaces the pieces and says, this is my universe. These Mm -hmm. are my rules. You have to play it my way. And Riddler actually renounces his his name, you know, Edward Nigma. He says, Edward Nigma no longer exists. You might recall that he was once fired by an ungrateful employer. That was a private matter and should have remained one. He's clearly referencing the episode where we first met him, and he is blaming Batman for his becoming a fugitive. And I found that to be a nice way to draw back on that episode as well. What did you think? I like that. I I mean, clearly the Riddler has these identity issues, right? Mm -hmm. That he is trying to get away from that, that person, that, that guy that, um, although was brilliant, was rejected and was, was fired. And, and Batman is the one who exposed him. So what, what's really interesting is that Batman's, um, remark, Attempted homicide is never a private matter, Nigma. Talk about shutting that down. Mm-hmm. You know, like obviously homicide isn't a private matter. It's something that is clearly, you know, especially for Batman, this is something that hit deep. Mm-hmm. So he he really didn't validate anything that the Riddler was saying about his um his identity being smeared or or his inability to kind of um to recover from that. And Riddler actually says but it would have been if you hadn't interfered and turned Nigma into a fugitive. So I deleted Nigma. And that's sort of what we saw him doing at the beginning of the episode. And I think that plays to what you were saying about the fact that he didn't want to be associated with this person that he essentially saw as a failure. Right. So you can imagine that thought process like, I will just, you know, delete, burn, um, shred any file that has any of my history, you know, driving record, as you, as you mentioned, medical records, police records, anything that, you know, has my information, ident- identifying information, social security, mm-hmm. past history, any of those things. And that ultimately he believed that that would erase this other identity. Right. And, you know, obviously that that's not true. If you, 
you know, if you set fire to all of your, all of your records, paper or electronic, you could never get away from your history. It will always be there. It, it lives in your mind, you know? So I I think that that, that was, um, you know, quite a, a deep moment, you know, for, for him to admit that he was trying to do that. And I think he knows that, that he failed. Right. Yeah. And the rest of this episode basically deals with Batman not only solving the Riddler's riddles, but also manipulating them in such a way that it it makes them all winnable. And he ends up defeating the Riddler by having him split his attention into 32 different ways. And he can't hold his world together. And the virtual reality ends up basically crumbling on itself. Batman gets Gordon out. Now, Gordon was actually in real danger. We, we talk about virtual reality and we talk about this environment, but Gordon was in legitimate danger. He only had like 15 minutes to get Gordon out before his heart would fail. Right. So the Riddler explained that the distress that the Commissioner Gordon was in while trapped in his virtual reality world was so realistic that in real life, he was experiencing that physiological distress and that his heart would give out in 15 minutes. So as people might know from other episodes of the Arkham Sessions, I like to bring in real cases, if at all possible, or if not real cases, legit science from a non-psychological perspective. And uh, I found a a pretty interesting uh, bit in this book, Forensics and Fiction, uh, which I've referenced in the past. It's uh, written by uh, Dr. D.P. Lyle, who is a consultant for various mystery novelists and uh, TV shows and things like that. And he's got these great books. If you ever want to write for mysteries or or crime thrillers, uh, he basically goes through the ins and outs of, of how things work. And I found a question that someone had given him uh, to be particularly appropriate for this episode. It doesn't specifically talk about virtual reality, but it does ask, can a character die from an imagined disease? Huh. So we talk about uh, hypochondriacs and things like that, and people give themselves these sort of psychosomatic symptoms that, that their body actually sort of starts to believe that they really are sick. Well, this could also be translated into virtual reality, because as we've discussed, your body can actually feel like it's in this environment. So he actually answers that the general terms for this are psychogenic, which means uh, that the symptoms are generated in the psyche, and hypochondriacal, which means the illnesses are imagined where none are present. Well, while he goes on to say that things like hives and and asthma-like symptoms can certainly occur with these stressors, uh, they're typically something that can be easily remedied if you get treatment for them. However, he does say, yes, people can die from extreme psychological stress and panic. This type of stress can cause a massive outpouring of adrenaline from the adrenal glands, which lie within the abdomen near the kidneys. This large output of adrenaline can cause deadly cardiac arrhythmia, which are changes in in heart rhythm, and spasms, which essentially uh, clamp down and and the narrowing of the uh, coronary arteries that can lead to a myocardial infarction, uh, basically a, a heart attack. And this would be particularly true if the victim had any underlying coronary artery disease, like the hardening of the arteries in the first place. So a panicked victim would develop shortness of breath, a rapid and heavy heartbeat, chest pain, and maybe even wheezing and a rash, and then could potentially collapse and die. What's interesting is that these are the exact symptoms that Gordon seems to be yeah. suffering from the, the, the real shortness of breath and his heart is racing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Riddler says, you've got 15 minutes before he's going to have a heart attack. Right, right. Well, and this is where this show becomes more science fiction than real. You know, I like that it's, I like that the, the show is called What is Reality? Because in fact, as we've talked about before, you cannot die from a panic attack. I would call this one of the first things that 
in therapy for panic disorder or panic attacks or any anxiety disorder that involves, um, you know, a, a huge amount of, of panic like symptoms, that that is one of the misconceptions that we deal with immediately. So there, there's some truth, you know, to, to this author that you're referring to in that if you have some pre existing conditions, heart condition, um, some kind of medical condition that would predispose you to being vulnerable. In other words, if you are under a lot of distress, um, you know, when do heart attacks happen? Mm -hmm. When do those types of um, uh, infarctions happen? It's under stress, right? Mm -hmm. So he's correct in that you have to have some some kind of um, pre-existing condition. But the symptoms of panic, the psychological panic that occurs, for instance, the symptoms characterized by, you know, rapid heartbeat, um, feeling, feeling sudden cold or hot flashes, mm -hmm. feeling, um, you know, having difficulty breathing, the shortness of breath or their chest pain, those kinds of things that are, that are really just sort of circumscribed within a panic attack, you cannot die from that. That mm -hmm. is a, a sort of physical reaction to a psychological belief or a psychological state. The important aspect of this question is that the person asking the question wanted to know what the impact um, was from an imagined illness, mm -hmm. right? Any imagined experience, especially one one that's you know of course happening without virtual reality, mm -hmm. that that cannot cause death unless there is some pre-existing condition. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, now, what's happening with Commissioner Gordon and why that um, kind of breaks these rules around um, fantasy or science fiction is that we don't know the full extent of this virtual reality experience. Is by being hooked in, is he actually experiencing those, um, you know, those symptoms of, of that are similar to having a heart attack? But we also don't know if. Gordon is as fully aware of his presence as Batman is. Batman understands that I am essentially in the matrix. Mm -hmm. I can I can manipulate this the way that I want right. to manipulate it. Gordon needed to be told what the virtual reality was. He had no real understanding of what world he was in. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that that he is not imagining this environment quite as much as someone like say Batman would Batman understands where he is and Gordon might feel legitimate, a, le a legitimate threat. Right. And right. if for some reason, these adrenal glands are over pumping, you know, or something like that, it, it, it very well may be. I can't imagine that Gordon doesn't have daily stress being the police commissioner sure. of Gotham city. Sure. I'm thinking there must be some hardening of the artery somewhere I wouldn't be surprised if someone in his state might be given a heart attack uh, through virtual reality. I don't, I don't know. It's. I thought it was interesting because I, I didn't think that I would find any sort of answer that was like a, an affirmative to this sort of thing. So to hear a medical examiner actually say, well, under the right conditions, right. something like this could happen. Right. And I think that's the truth. That's, that's really the truth is that, um, you know, it's not impossible. This isn't, yeah. this isn't science fiction. This it's just not likely. Is, it's very unlikely yeah. because again, while we have a lot of power with our mind and while we can do some amazing things, you know, just by willing our, ourselves to. So for instance, we can bring our own heart rates down. We do this with relaxation and mindfulness, right? Mm -hmm. So some therapeutic interventions that ask us to, um, you know, um, slow um, and pace our, our breathing to, um, you know, find a, a meditative state to um, to calm our bodies. That in turn slows our heart rate. That in turn gives us more oxygen. That in turn, um, you know, provides uh, a state of calmness that can actually reduce feelings of panic mm -hmm. and anxiety. So, you know, again, one of the first things we do in therapy is to teach someone how to get get control of their body and to try to. Um, just kind of um, moderate those those experiences, and and in fact, it's it's very possible to change your physical state just with your mind, right? So you could almost use 
you could use virtual reality as a therapeutic device. It's done. In fact, virtual reality is one of the areas in terms of psychological interventions that have been, you know, it just has been an in increasing um, and, and becoming more popular as far as um, just the fact that there's no boundaries to it. I mean, right. it's, it's really amazing. There's there's some research that shows that um, for for anxiety disorders, for phobias, for PTSD, that being in a virtual reality um, state for, uh, you know, numerous times over a period of, of a few weeks can can really improve someone's functioning. Mm -hmm. So as an example, let's say that you're, um, you're f afraid of flying and you can, your therapist can hook you up to virtual reality and you can experience um, flying in an airplane yeah. several times a week. Yeah. Now that's not realistic for one to do in real life, right? As a therapist, I can't put you on a plane every you know two, three times a week to, uh, to get that full effect. It's not feasible economically. It's not feasible in terms of time. It's, it's certainly a huge undertaking. So to be able to have you sit in an office and, and have you look at virtual reality or, or hook into virtual reality and get on a plane, so to speak, mm -hmm. two, three times or more a week, that allows you to have that simulated experience of being on a plane. Right. And the idea is that that experience um, kind of, uh, it will emulate what what the real environment would be for you. What would that do for you? That would increase your heart rate. That would put you into a panic state. That would, um, you know, give you the sensation that you can't breathe. That would give you the sensation that you can't see well. That would give you, you know, the dizziness, all those kinds of feelings that would feel very real to you. Yeah. Um, but ultimately you would know you are in a virtual reality, um, you know, simulator and you wouldn't, you know that at the end of the day you are safe. So it offers a lot of benefits that, um, you know, just kind of talk therapy um, wouldn't offer. And, and it is seen by patients as much safer and, and something that they're more willing to do than say, you know, get on a bridge or get on a plane or be exposed to some of the things that they're afraid of. So I was raised in a military family. I, I know a lot of veterans. Uh, I know that there was a, a form of therapy for a little while, and it may even still be used, where they would show veterans uh, images that might trigger certain feelings or emotions to alleviate the stress they were feeling of, of having been in combat and, right. and stuff like that. Is this the sort of thing where virtual reality would be a benefit? Absolutely. And, and that kind of intervention, in fact, has been utilized for um, veterans and soldiers who have returned from Iraq and Afghanistan and, and who ex have experienced this kind of combat PTSD mm -hmm. that, you know, obviously the unethical, unsafe thing to do would be to put them in actual dangerous situations. Because remember, their PTSD stems from combat, which is an actual dangerous situation. Yeah. Why would I want to put you back in that, in that scenario? Mm -hmm. But we know through a lot of research that experiencing those sensations again and being able to monitor self-regulate and come down, recover from those experiences in a right. way that they feel like they have control, that is actually really beneficial. So what we've done, what I've done is to, is to have real life environmental exposures. So, um, for a lot of soldiers I've worked with, you know, it, we would, we would do very safe things like, um, watching fireworks, going to a gun range, um, going somewhere where you might hear loud noises, you might see things, you might experience things that would trigger those emotional and cognitive kind of reactions mm -hmm. that an IED, you know, created you know, back at war. Right. But these would be agreed upon scenarios that we both know you're safe. We both know you're willing and, and, you know, interested in, in participating in You're in not it. trying to shock them. Not, not at all. Not yeah. at all. And they're all very gradual things. You start out small and, and you increase the, the challenge. And, you know, ultimately, again, the idea is that with multiple exposures and multiple experiences in safe environments, the the patient will learn to habituate mm -hmm. to those sounds, sights, smells, feelings, all those things, and will be able to kind of grow. I mean, there is there are these reinterpretations of those sensations. Right. No longer I'm unsafe, I'm scared, I'm gonna panic, but I'm in a safe place, I know how to control my body, 
I'm going to recover from this. I'll be fine. I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of um, recovery experiences that they didn't quite get back at war for, for whatever reason. So now with virtual reality, you get to do all that with very realistic scenarios. Yeah. Again, with the willingness and participation and, and, you know, decision-making on the part of the patient. So they can decide that they can be in, um, virtual reality environments that would emulate those things, especially if they plan to be redeployed Mm -hmm. so that they'll, you know, again, they'll learn these, these wonderful anxiety management skills so that they can no longer interpret these kinds of, of, um, environments as dangerous to them. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And it, it actually is exciting to think about the fact that when we think of virtual reality, we think of I sort of immediately jump to video games. I jump yeah. to, you think of home entertainment where people are trying to sell you Oculus Rift, uh, you know, stations in your in your home or you go to the mall to an arcade if they still exist. Uh, or you go to a convention where you can participate in these things that take you three hours to get through lines, uh, you know, to jump off of walls. And, and you just think entertainment, but it's fascinating to think about all of the therapeutic ways that virtual reality could be used and all the people that it could actually help. I mean, it could, it could essentially help Batman if Batman reaches a, you know, a stressful level. Uh, although I guess Batman would probably, uh, he would always view it as somewhat lesser because he, he, he knows like he's, he's right. just above it, but, but, well, you know, and, and police in, in officers fairness, and firemen and veterans and, and people who've been in car accidents and things like right. that. Like, it seems like this sort of technology could certainly be used to, to get people back to, to, you know, I don't want to say normal, but right. you know, right. And it, I was going to say in fairness, the, you know, the individuals who are receiving this kind of virtual reality intervention for the most part, they do know that they're, you know, it's not as if they're expected to kind of dissociate and believe that they're actually experiencing that environment. But, you know, again, because they may be prone to flashbacks, they may be prone to intrusive thoughts, images, um, they, they may get lost in that Mm -hmm. kind of world and, and really, you know, experience a lot of physiological panic during that experience. So uh, Batman might be more sophisticated in terms of his, uh, his higher level knowledge that, you know, of course he was able to take down the Riddler in this virtual reality world in a way that he manipulated that world, Mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, which is the science fiction piece of this, right? Yeah. Like when you, when you are on the wall uh, in the game of Thrones, uh, it is designed so that you are hit with an arrow and you fall in order to give you that experience. My understanding is that it's not something that you can manipulate the way you can, you know, the matrix. However, if Batman were put on this wall, I guarantee he would survive. Like there would be, he would figure out a way to not only <laughs> dodge the arrow, but then he would also create a shield with one hand and a sword with another, and he he would defeat the army yeah. that was that was. Uh, I would on the love other side. to watch this uh, the scene that you're creating with yeah. Batman and and all the the Game of Thrones warriors. He'd just be like, "No, guys, we're in virtual. Come on, we're in virtual reality. We got this." And he he'd just take care of it. Yeah, it's fine. Well, it's interesting. We should also be very cautious around the reality versus virtual reality because a very well-cited study recently found that in um, in the brains of rats who are in a virtual reality, there's actually different functioning happening that because it's simulated, certain parts of brain mapping um, are activated differently than when you're kind of in a real environment. And I think this makes a lot of sense, but it was a groundbreaking study that found that the they're, they're called place cells in the, in the area called the hippocampus of the brain. Those place cells aren't really activated as much. They don't light up per se as much when they're in a virtual reality experience or experiment as when they, they did when the, the rats were engaging in the real world. So again, confirming the idea that when you're in an environment that's real, you're smelling, tasting, feeling, you're experiencing the something that's difficult to do in virtual reality, that presence, that idea of presence, 
um, you know, simple things like pressure of, of the air, pressure around you, um, three dimensions, you know, knowing how far something is in front of you, behind you, mm -hmm. feeling the ground beneath you, all these things that are so unique to our, our experience. The brain is so sophisticated that it recognizes that environment differently mm -hmm. than a virtual reality, a simulated reality where visually you might see things and physically you may even experience things, but the brain almost catches on that this is not quite a one-to-one -one representation. And so there's underactivation of certain parts of the brain that are involved with, with that mapping. Oh, wow. And um, the reason this was groundbreaking is that... Um, I, I think there were concerns that that people you know, maybe maybe this uh, this cartoon about the Riddler and and using virtual reality to to try to attack the Batman. I think that people had concerns around the dangers of virtual reality and how that those experiences can can influence people mm -hmm. because they would be too real. Right. It's interesting that you say that that people can be scared of virtual reality or that there is a, a negative impact because there are actually famous people who have experienced virtual reality around the time of this episode. I mean, I think it was uh, in 1991, 92, somewhere in there, uh, the, the famous psychologist and author, Timothy Leary, mm -hmm. who was famous for his studies on the use of LSD and uh, psychotropic, uh, psychotropic? drugs mm -hmm. uh, he got to experience early virtual reality and basically said that it was what lsd yeah. was uh in in decades past uh jerry garcia who was very famous for you know uh, drug use uh, the the lead singer of the grateful dead he got to experience virtual reality and actually mentioned that um you know, back in the day, they, they outlawed LSD, but now you're going to have virtual reality. And it's going to give you the exact same mm -hmm. experience. And people who are advocates of uh, virtual reality are basically saying, you know, not only is it absurd, you're, you're sort of poisoning the well. Like you're 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 kind of messing up what it is we're trying to do here. And uh, and then you've got those people who are sort of jumping on that, you know, and, and around the time of this episode, you had people who were fighting on one side or the other about like the negative impacts of virtual reality right. and the positive impacts of virtual reality. And I think I think I'm glad to hear that it sounds like the positive is sort of winning out. Well, certainly with all the advancements, it seems as though the positives outweigh the negatives. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly virtual reality is not yet at the point where um, the technology is plugged into your nervous system, um, you know, to your circulatory system, to your endocrine system. Like it's 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 really just about the way that your brain's working and how you're thinking. So with that with that being said, much of the advancements have been toward kind of how we can use the mind to heal the body, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, actually a great study that was done a couple of years ago by my colleague, Dr. Robin Rosenberg up at Stanford. Um, it's the superhero study. And it shows that by just by being in a virtual reality um, task, just doing something in virtual reality that's quite heroic can, can cause people to engage in more pro-social behavior. So the particular study I'm thinking of is one in which these participants would go into this um, virtual reality simulator. They'd have these video displays. And in one group, they would be, uh, they would, they would be kind of um, touring through this city. Like it's a, it clearly a virtual reality city. It's not very detailed. And you're above all these buildings and you're in a helicopter. Now the other group were flying like, like Superman, like your arms extended out in front of you and you're flying through the city. Mm -hmm. And the task is basically later on you, you're um, assigned. Uh, of course you're assigned to one of these groups and then you're looking for a missing diabetic child who's in need of insulin. So kind of a, a crisis that you're, you're, you're trying to, uh, to solve. Sure. Now, those who were given the power to fly like Superman in virtual reality were more helpful afterwards um, in the real world compared with the participants who were passengers in a virtual helicopter. So volunteers who had virtual superpowers 
moved about three times faster on average than the helicopter folks um, when they were doing things like helping, assisting someone who dropped something or spilled things. And they showed, in fact, the people that were more empathetic and didn't help. Mm -hmm. Again, in the real world, the folks that didn't help were the folks who were just passengers in a helicopter. So you can see how just having the experience of being a superhero, even though it's simulated, will increase pro-social helpful behavior in real life. Okay. Isn't that cool? That is cool. So, you know, again, it just a couple of examples, but these are just reasons why maybe virtual reality could help us to uh, not just better understand the brain, but also to help us learn how to build some experiences or behaviors that we want to increase, right. like pro-social behavior, helpful behavior, I don't know, superheroes. Yeah. I'm I'm thinking like we were talking about the positive benefits of this, but at the same time, I know that while it's not necessarily virtual reality, I know that a lot of drone pilots in the military now, you they, like the the military is kind of recruiting mm-hmm. gamers to to be drone pilots because they've spent so much time playing Call of Duty and you know these other things that uh, that to them looking at a screen and you know pulling a trigger is it's all the same to them there there's a disconnect there where they're they're not necessarily right. feeling the 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 horrors of being in combat they are dropping bombs and they are using guns on drones to to kill mm-hmm. but to them it's still just a video game mm-hmm. Right. And well, and as you know, you have a lot of experience with this. That um, I kill people all the time with drones. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm and I'm I'm good with it. In addition to that, you have a lot of experience in in your knowledge about um, virtual reality and training. That mm. nowadays, you know, a lot of the military training involves virtual reality. Whether mm-hmm. you're learning to be a pilot or you're learning to be a combatant out in the front lines. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. This actually reminds me, I mean, you, you can actually think back to technology and and what could have been seen as virtual reality, even dating back to the early days of cinema. I mean, this it's not so, I realize that it's not virtual reality in the sense that, that we think of it, but when you look back to probably one of the earliest films in, in 1903, The Great Train Robbery, The final shot in that movie, which is famous, is of the leader of the of the train robbers sort of sitting against this map background and he aims his pistol at the camera and pulls the trigger. Um, In fact, if you've ever seen uh, Tombstone, it's at the beginning of Tombstone. You're you're seeing Mm -hmm. these this black and white, the silent film stuff and and one of the cowboys aims his gun at you and and shoots that was a real shot put at the end of this movie the great train robbery in 1903 and it terrified audiences famously they ran away you know thinking that this thing on the screen Mm -hmm. can show is real right like they had never seen anything like this before uh that there's a similar case with a, a, a movie that was, um, God, way back when, and, and it was actually called uh, The Arrival of a Train at, and I'm going to mispronounce this because I don't speak French, but uh, uh, La Cita. Uh, and that was essentially, that was a short film, and that was in the 1890s, mid-1890s sometime, and that was a train literally coming at you. And... Mm-hmm. That famously terrified audiences, and uh, you know we don't know if it's true or urban legend, but it's believed that people ran from you know seeing this train mm-hmm. right coming right at them, and uh, I can imagine that that's sort of where virtual reality is today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's no different than you know today one of us putting on a virtual reality headset and. Um, flinching or moving away when when something is is coming towards us or we think we're going to be struck with something that's that seems like the equivalent you know mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the late 1800s early 1900s experiences with film yeah that that is it's essentially the the brain processing information and and communicating with the body so i think you know obviously the 
there are no boundaries to this, you know, there are no limits to this. This can, this can really be amazing. And, and my question for you would be for this episode, do you think now, again, the Riddler created this virtual reality world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this was a message to viewers that virtual reality is, is a bad thing? No, I think what it was, was an understanding that the Riddler is technologically inv- advanced. I think because he invented this video game, the Maze of the Minotaur, like, I think it's in his wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. I, and I think that he has used it to his advantage. I don't think it is negative uh, or portrayed negatively in this particular episode. Um I did find it interesting that uh, at a time where the internet was still sort of in its infancy uh, of people like logging on and, and, you know, through modems and, and, and hanging out in chat rooms and things like that, I found it interesting that this was essentially what we do today with online gaming. I mean, it, it was riddler coming in from another location we find out at the end of the episode that he's at the world's fair and he's in his own setup and he's interacting via network the riddler and batman are basically like gaming together yeah yeah it's it's you know riddler is essentially trolling batman (laughs) the original troll was the riddler i guess maybe batman is actually the one trolling because he's the one refusing to play properly (laughs) uh you know riddler's just pissed that he's you know doesn't have someone playing his game the right way um, but, uh, but no, I, I don't think it's seen as negative, um, because I, I think part of it is because Robin is so excited by it. Yeah. Like he, if, if Robin were terrified of it, then maybe it would be seen as a bit more negative, but Robin is sort of excited by the idea of this, of this technology. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I think it was just them sort of ushering in a new era of gaming and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I thought it was really cool. Yeah, it's a great episode. So you are absolutely right. There's plenty of psychology to be discussed, and uh, and I'm I'm glad that we decided to not go forward with next week's episode um, this week. So uh, congratulations, Drea. Congratulations to you. Thank you. But next week we are going to be taking a look at I Am the Night written by Michael Reeves, directed by Boyd Kirkland. And this one is a famous episode. A lot of people love this episode, uh, particularly for certain lines of dialogue. So, uh, Drea, you're going to have to come back. We're going to have to talk about that one. I will. You guys are all going to have to come back, and we're going to talk about that one. Until then, Drea, where can they find you online? My website is underthemaskonline.com. I've got some articles, of course, this podcast, and other features there. On Twitter, I'm at Arkham Asylum Doc. And my email is arkhamasylumdoc at gmail.com. And you can find me. I am on Twitter. I am at bward028. And you can find us both on Twitter. We are at Arkham Sessions. You can also email us your questions. We are arkhamsessions at gmail.com. Until next week with I Am The Night, I'm Brian Ward. I'm Dr. Andrea Letamendi. And we are the Arkham Sessions. <laughs>